Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, I feel like things couldn't have gone better this morning for us. I think we got really uh, teed up with the talks this morning. Um, Multi-platformism, a call to action from Gabe and JJ to uh, make interactivity work. Yeah, we're doing that in April. Um, so one of the things we wanted to share with you is just sort of, you know, the concept, uh, what we're trying to do, how it came to be, a lot of the sticking points that we went through, because there were many. Um, and really, I think the place where we'll start is the beginning. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, I, uh, I run original programming uh, development for sci-fi, and five years ago, and it's really weird that it's been five years, because it certainly didn't set out to be a five-year plan, uh, we wanted to get into um, a more expansive place with our content. It's a natural extension for our audience already. And um, we found Tryon, who were this amazing online gaming company that had re were kind of relatively uh, new at that time. Uh, and they had all this great innovative technology that felt like it would match, mesh well with um, kind of storytelling and um, dynamically changing worlds and things like that. So we made a deal with them to try to develop property together. Yeah, and, and for us, so much of it was the challenge. Um, it is so rare in this industry that you get to do something and you can say that uh, it's pioneering and it's not a bunch of hyperbole and, and you know, marketing talk. Um, and being able to work with, with Mark to create a world from day one that's big enough and expansive enough to hold a top tier video game and a high quality television show. Um, and, and I think the, the thing that I think really drove us both is not make any compromises, right? The quality or is not the, to make fatal compromises, right? Not, <laughs> I think whenever you start with one IP from a, a game or you start from a, a film or a TV series, adapting it sometimes ruins it. Um, and so how do you not do that? Uh, and, and I think it was also really attractive to us to tap at this audience of gamers that um, are not necessarily our core audience. And so to have something that not only um, persists between seasons so that it's a world that, that continues, but also could change and, and amplify um, our, the series world, because I think that's one of the biggest frustrations we have is we have 13 episodes, we go off the air for sometimes nine months or more, and then we hope everyone's gonna come back again. And to have a way to continue that storytelling was really exciting to us. And if I can pull all those gamers over as well, um, that's awesome. Yeah, and for us, if we're running a game as a service, then we have a force multiplier every year of a television show. That's, that's cool. Um, so I, I think one of the things we get into is, you know, how do you actually begin? What was uh, the idea? Yeah. What were we going to do? What was the world going to be? Right. Um, and so the beginning, Mark Swoop sent us a bunch of scripts. And a lot Which of we thought were perfect for games. <laughs> oh, yeah, just do Eureka. It'll be awesome. Uh, and I think what's cool is we saw a bunch of scripts that later on became a uh, pretty successful show. So part of us is on the game side, we're nerding out because we got to see into the, uh, the underbelly of the world of television. Um, but we also realized that, that for us, where we're doing a deep 24 by 7 world and we're looking at treatments for pilots where it's a character study, um, it, j it just wasn't deep enough for us. And I think that's where we had the moment where we realized that if we approach things traditionally, like between games and Hollywood, where someone's first and someone's second, um, we were gonna get a traditional result. And I, I think that was something we wanted to avoid because I think if you look at a licensor and licensee relationship, generally the licensee has to make compromise and their product suffers, um, and, and we didn't wanna do that. And so we had to take this moment and just stand back and completely change our approach, and we had these series of seminal meetings up at Mark's offices in LA. Yeah, which were re was really interesting because basically you're kind of reaching around in the dark. We know what we needed to make a great TV series, hopefully we know, but we certainly know what the elements were in a world that we needed to be able to tell a story and, and uh, have characters in that world. And, um, and then it was a matter of us trading back ideas to find the right one that fit for both of us, and that led us to this uh, mythology that, uh, should we talk about the mythology? Sure. So the, the mythology is, is in essence, um, we're in the future. In our present, uh, these giant alien arcs come into orbit around the Earth, and it's um, uh, seven alien species that are emigrating uh, and want to settle here. And in the process of trying to negotiate a way to live among us, the arcs crash. And so uh, the, their terraformers run amok, 
And so we're joining the, the world of the game in the series um, decades later when the Earth has been now transformed and is a mix of alien and Earth, uh, flora and fauna. There's been a massive war. And, um, and so the game takes place in San Francisco. This was also a decision that we came to very early, which now feels like a very organic and, a, and how could you not have it this way, but it was really a, something we had to figure out was, are we all in the same place? Are we all living in San Francisco together? Or you know, are we living yeah. apart in separate apartments? And so we decided to be in, in St. Louis. Actually, I wanted to be in San Francisco, but they already called dibs on it. So it was like, fine, you get the Golden Gate Bridge. And we went to St. Louis because it was interesting for us. I needed another icon. And you've only got, you don't have a lot. You've got Rushmore, you've got Golden Gate Bridge, you obviously you've got the Statue of Liberty, which is a little too cliche, uh, especially for us. And, um, and then there's the Gateway to the West, the uh, Arch. So, and I'd never seen a series kind of set in that um, Midwest, uh, St. Louis, with the Mississippi. So we took St. Louis, and that allowed a separation as well to be able to share the world and the universe and the mythology, but also be separate when we need to be separate. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that really helped us uh, have this, this broad panoply from which to paint is those seven alien races that came over, they fled their solar system because bad things were going to happen and it was out of necessity. It wasn't like they came over and it was a utopian society and they were all friends. Um, so when the art ships crashed, there was war and it wasn't humans against the seven alien races, it was chaotic and times change, you know, sides change and there's backstabbing and all that sort of stuff. And so then you think about you've got these seven races, the humans, you've got terraforming where there's pockets of old earth and hybrid and pure alien. That's an awesome... Uh, it's a rich stew. Yes, <laughs> and the rich stew. Um, and I think there go uh, directly in sort of what, what the game is. So one, one of the things that the terraforming has done is it's changed all of the resources that we know it today. And in San Francisco, uh, there's a new gold rush, and there's an element called goulonite um, that is uh, very, very uh, dense in San Francisco. So the player plays the role of an arc hunter. Um, arc hunters are people that chase pieces of these arc ships when they enter the atmosphere and crash the ground, and sometimes there's technology in them, sometimes there's cool weapons, uh, sometimes there's bad guys that you have to fight, but that's how you're gonna go make your, your fame and fortune. So. Uh, the game's also, it's, it's a massive online shooter, and what that really means, it's a third-person shooter, um, and you travel in the open world of San Francisco. So you can start in Marin, go down to Sausalito, have your Planet of the Apes moment when you see the ruins of the Golden Gate Bridge, and eventually make your way into the city of San Francisco itself. As you're traveling across this world, you can uh, interact with thousands of players. You'll see them as, as you're you know, cruising around in your ATV or, or your car, um, and you can choose to play with them or not. Um, and we think this is one of the things that's, that's really cool and innovative that, that our uh, client server architecture lets us do, is just the, the scale that, that we can bring. And then we do a bunch of things to play with it, where we get emergent gameplay, where we'll have a, we have a shadow war, which is a capture and hold mode that you play in this open world. Um, but all the AI are there. And so you have enemies, you have the, the hell bugs and uh, the miners and all, all the bad guys. They don't care that you're playing capture and hold with other humans. And so you have a lot of decision making and uh, challenge beyond what you would see in, in a normal just like capture and hold map or something like that. And, and it spawns you know, miles and miles of gameplay. So again, at scale. We have arc falls where uh, you know, those giant pieces fall to the ground. It's a cooperative play where we get you know 50, 100 players working together to take this thing down and, and loot it, right? Because it's all about fat loot. Um, we incent the players. The more people that participate, the better the rewards are for everyone. And it's a way of just really sort of bringing massively social uh, to what's going on. And then that ties in with the show where the heroes are also hark hunters. I don't understand half of what you just said, by the way. <laughs> oh, capture and hold maps. That's awesome. Uh, which is why it was really important for us to be separated from, from them because um, we didn't, you know, there are things that they really needed to do that we really didn't want to do, like have lots of people with guns running through our town. Um, so the series is set, as I mentioned, in St. Louis. And it's really um, one of the things uh, that I loved, uh, one of the things I loved about the concept of, that we were coming up with was it allowed us to do a frontier story. It allowed us, in essence, to do a Western. And I think it's been a long time since we've seen a Western, certainly a, 
it's been since Firefly since we saw a sci-fi western. And I thought it just feels like a great opportunity to do a frontier town story, and it, um, but one that's also very optimistic and it's kind of a boom town. And where San Francisco is a little more, has a little more technology, you know, my analogy is if you went to the 1860s and you went out to say the middle of the, uh, the Midwest uh, to Denver, you're gonna see a lot of, of very rough um, technology. If you went to New York at that time, you'd start to see the beginnings of um, electricity and you'd see trolley cars and things like that. So San Francisco has got different levels of technology than, um, than Defi the town of Defiance has in St. Louis. But basically, everything else is very similar. Uh, the aliens are obviously the same. And the story is about, um, uh, the core of the story is Nolan, who is Grant Buller, who's in the center of our poster, um, and his surrogate uh, daughter, who is an alien um, named Arissa. And um, he becomes the new sheriff of this town. So it's very iconic in, so, in, in very clean, understandable ways. And then it also has all this great rich stew of alienness and, and <laughs> mythology and cool imagery on, uh, loaded in as well. Cool. One of the things that, it, that I think was interesting is just as we work with each other through the years, uh, things that we thought were really important uh, maybe weren't, or things that were easy for us uh, were hard for them and vice versa. So uh, we built the engine, the game engine for Defiance from the ground up. We had some great engine architects and, and, and you know, you go with what you're good at. So we got to the point where we finally get water in the game, right? And this is always the big awesome moment. You're looking like, look, I have reflection and you know, all the, the wave particles are working right and look, isn't this neat and I'm swimming and we're, we're going through this whole thing and we're demoing for Mark and his crew and uh, Mark picks up a water bottle and goes, yeah, we can do water too. Um, I didn't that, say it like that. I was much more like, <laughs> I didn't mean to insult him. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty humbling. Um, because for us, it was this thing that, you know, we had our best engineers on and, and all sort of stuff and he's like, yeah, we just turn on the hose. Um, but I think it's a good example of kind of what we, how far apart we were in, in terms of cultures. I think one of just, you know, the very beginning, we really had to figure out what we didn't know at, or what we learn each other's process, learn how to, to speak to each other. Their development process is completely the opposite of, of a television film development process where you start with character and story and uh, narrative and they're building their sets in essence. Yeah. Um, you know, art is the long lead time, right? And so for us, we really want to nail down what's gonna look on, you know, good on screen and, and what our character's gonna look like and, and the aliens and all that sort of stuff. And, and I think the good thing is there were enough big ticket items like that that, that we sort of fell into organically natural owners for different parts of, uh, as we deal with the IP. So, you know, art for us, character and character development for them. We also really, so I think we had to kind of get some rules of the road. What, what are the shared elements of this world that are gonna be inherent to them and, um, and that we're all gonna can agree to? And again, uh, that was a process of a certain amount of negotiation and, um, and I, I think one of the, well, the next, the next slide I think goes to the, to the point about one of the early conversations, because I'm doing a frontier town, so I wanna do horses, because that would be cool. And, um, and so we sat down with these guys, they came in and, uh, and we were started talking about, so are there horses? Can, what's the level of technology? And, and we didn't want to do horses at all, right? We're, we're a shooter, it's per pixel accuracy. And if you're on like this big giant horse that just increases your target, it's not cool, it makes you worse. Um, and plus, you know, our whole animation system and everything that we're spending money on, it's all about bipeds. And we don't, you know, didn't want to contemplate having bipeds on top of a quadruped. We're like, We'd rather just focus on that, that core gameplay. Um, but what we thought would be really, really cool is flying, right? Because you have all these alien races and there'd be these key gadgets and vehicle gameplay, so much fun in, in shooters. So we want to have flying. Which I really don't want to fly. Because I'm trying to do a frontier town story and if I have people flying in, in their helicopters, it's not exactly a frontier anymore. It needs to be isolated. It needs to be hard to get to. That's part of the whole idea of being out there in the, in the wilderness. So. Uh, it was like, all right, fine, I won't do horses if you don't do flying. Yeah, but, and but we did cool vehicles, though. They were, like, absolutely. amazing vehicles. And we also put a huge, like, what we call the storm divide. That's a very, very difficult um, badlands between St. Louis and San Francisco, so you really can't get between them unless we want you to. <laughs> I think one of the things, though, that, that I think turned out quite well 
uh, out of this is, you know, Mark didn't get his pony and I didn't get my spaceships, but we uh, uh, brought in a consultant that Mark worked with in the past from JPL. And the guy basically explained to us um, how we could make this, you know, rubble asteroid field actually work on the Earth, and, and what's the guy? Uh, Kevin Grazer, who's a, a science advisor that we uh, worked with on Battlestar, and he, he's coming on all of our shows. He's an amazing guy who is a rocket scientist and just advises these guys on getting accurate with uh, their te their tech stuff. Yeah. So that ended up uh, being the the inspiration for what became the Arc Falls, which were those uh, massively social events, and we've got the example one in that screenshot, the big screenshot. Um, and this right now, when we're doing our betas and, and, and our alpha testing, this is one of our most popular features. So we got one of our most popular features out of this whole process. And so it, it, it's, I think, one of the interesting ways that this development has occurred. I think that's, I mean, for all the, um, the obstacles and the things to figure out, I think what the benefit of that is, and we'll, we talk about it a, a, a bit as well, is you get all this great top spin, um, not to have all this incredible landscape, all this set design, um, all these conceptual art uh, uh, pieces to hand off to our production designer, to our visual effects supervisor, to the wardrobe uh, department, is something you never get uh, the luxury of having when you're doing a, a show in which you have to create a world. It's usually coming in the last month or two, so to be that far ahead of the game was a great benefit, although it was terrifying because we're not used to signing off on things like years ahead of time. Well, yeah, and this is the best example because <laughs> we, one of the early, one of the other rules of the road that we establish is aliens need to be human sized or within the range of human believability because we want to be able to cast them and we don't want to have to put a lot of makeup on them. And, um, and so that was one of the, the parameters we established. And then we, we had this meeting at, this is from, this is the actual image that we based this meeting at uh, E3 in 2009. Um, so, we had set those base rules for, for what castable aliens were, and you know, hey, that's a new word. Um, Not for me. <laughs> um, and, and so we gave them this lineup, and we're like, well, we need you guys to commit, because we're going to build them as, you know, some of them as playable races, and some of them as, as uh, AI-controlled races, but we're going to put this huge effort in them, and you need to sign off now. And it, I, I, I remember this slide. Um, because it was terrifying to me because I didn't, I didn't have a pilot script. I didn't know exactly what, the, what we were going to need and whether this was going to work. I didn't have a wardrobe department or, uh, you know, so to just go, all right, we're just going to do this then um, because there's enough in there for us to work with was a real, that was one of the times we really stepped off the cliff. And then you went to shoot three years later. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I think that's the big perspective, right, is, is... And these aliens have changed quite a bit, actually. Yeah. One of those aliens is now a rock. Yeah, the, the second one, the, the Gulani, the sort of blue and gray one, yeah, he, that's Gulanite now, so... So that's... <laughs> you didn't exactly live up to that either, did you? It's development. Um, that's actually cool, though, if you want to go back there, because I sure. think the other thing that was really exciting about this was there was a lot of interplay as we did start to really get into the detail and the Indigene, which is the kind of the third one in, um, uh, there was a, a lot of conversation with the makeup department um, about when they really started to bring those to life and make them real, uh, what they look like, the coloration. And there was a lot of back and forth with Nick's team about, all right, maybe we adjust this and shift that around. That was kind of cool, actually. It was a lot of, um, you really kind of got some synthesis of some uh, new ideas out of that. So, you know, it, it wasn't all... It was all easy. No, no, definitely not. Uh, you, you don't want to know what goes into sausage. You just want the tasty, tasty sausage. Right. Um, We're happy to tell you what's going <laughs> But, you know, I, I think we focus a lot on, on some of the obstacles that we've had and some of the things that, that we've had to work around. But there were some real wins, too. Um, and uh, these, these are uh, Volge. And they're bad guys. And it's, this, uh, it's a army of automatons. Um, they were not part of the of the Votan Collective, the, the seven races that came out. Um, and they're really big bad guys in the show, and they're really big bad guys in the game. Um, so the game, again, being the long lead time, we put them in, and, and they had a lot of our 
sort of core functionality. They had, you know, holsters and guns, and they draw and all this sort of stuff. And uh, one of the things I think that, that's helped us out a lot is uh, our art team and Mark's art team they use a lot of the same software. So our ability to pass assets back and forth is really, really great. So we sent them these guys because it was going to be a, a big part of the premiere. Yeah, in fact, there's a huge set piece at the end of the pilot, uh, or the end of the first episode, with this army that's trying to attack our town. And as um, Gary Hutzel and his team, Gary Hutzel's the visual effects supervisor, and he's worked with us on a ton of stuff, uh, most notably about Star Galactica. Um, they, as they started to actually work with these uh, images, they realized that if the if the bulge, um, because of the way the armor is on the shoulders, if they tr raise their arms over their head, they'd actually cut their heads off. So we we didn't need to do that in game. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. Um, so that was just one of many examples of of kind of this back and forth dialogue that that um, they had, and then the game changed the look, and then they actually went to um, the uh, the game guys and said, you know, rather than having a gun that you know you pull out like a traditional, let's just have it could pop up out of their arm. And so th they send the scene back to us where one of the Volge is, is threatening someone and there's just this great scene where it's framed and it's pointing its arm down and then just, you know, the gun comes out and fires and our artist saw that and they're like, oh shit, that's so much better than ours. Um, uh, but it was really inspirational because we're like, okay, screw this drawing gun. These guys are automatons. Let's go with it. Um, so we integrated the stuff that, that Gary and his team did. Um, and then what, what ended up happening at the end of the day is we went from where we were going to have, you know, the, this big army of automatons to where we have six different flavors of them because the back and forth that the two art teams did, the work was so great that we're just, yeah, we're going to use all of it. But it was, uh, I will say that probably the biggest challenge was, as, particularly as we got into production, because everyone, they, they understand their rhythms in production. They know what they need. They, need, they know who they need to go to to get approvals. But we were introducing a whole other variable into this, which was the gamer, uh, the game guys that did not have, they had different rules. And they had different things that were easy or hard, as we talked about with water. And so we had to really kind of, at every step of that process, re-educate um, each department about what we need to do, what the game plan was, what already existed, what they might be able to use. If they wanted to change something radically, then there would need to be a larger conversation about it. And, and I think that led to a uh, to new department, right? We have a mythology oh, yeah. coordinator. Well, yes, and then early on, it was very clear that when, as Kevin Murphy, the exec producer, and his team started breaking the stories for the se season, um, they were tapping into all these different things that from the game that they thought were really cool. Um, as we just mentioned, Arcfall, which is right up front in the, one of the first scenes in the pilot. But um, we need someone, we, they created a mythology coordinator role, which is a first for me, uh, whose jo a guy whose job it was just to relay what's going on in the writer's room to San Diego, to the Tryon guys, and back to make sure that everything is matching up, that what they're talking about is going to work for the game and vice versa. And, um, and that led to some very interesting, sometimes heated. I mean, there were times when Nick and I had to get in there and pull everyone apart and get buckets of water and yeah, pour it on people. I, I think one of the things that's really cool is like particularly at the, the height of the show production, I think it really stopped being about sci-fi and trying, and it was much more about defiance, because I think, you know, some of the stuff we talked about early, where we're setting up the basic rules, it's Mark and I and a few other people, but at that point, when, you know, we each have teams approaching 200 working on the game, you can't filter communication through two or three people, so we'd have 30 or 40 people talking to each other each and every day, and that's, I think that was part of the need of the mythology coordinator, because that's a lot of communication, a lot of opportunity for miscommunication, but I do think to me, the huge win was we had 30 or four people from each of our orgs talking to each other every day. That's awesome. It was also, I, I think those fights were great for me also because each team had their eye on the goal, which is I'm going to create the best game, period, or TV series. And so the friction points were points where you're compromising my vision in a way that doesn't, that's going to hurt what we're trying to accomplish. And so that's where you need to pay attention and make sure you weren't doing something that was going to ruin the experience for uh, what you're trying to create separately. Sure. So I, I think the, the big thing is the payout at the end. And you know, for us, the crossovers between the game and the show are some of the big things that Defiance can do because we've been together since the first day and we've been working on this together and, and you know, crafted the same vision. Um, 
and it's where we have these big beats with every episode as it's on air, where there's some massive crossover event from the game to the show, and some massive crossover event from the, from the show to the game. Um, and I think like a great one's the Contagion. Yeah, so we wanted to do, uh, we knew going on, uh, uh, starting out, that there were a couple of big moments that we definitely wanted to stage in the, um, in the first season. And one of those was a virus that would spread um, in our town from points outside of our town. Um, and, you know, we're not really uh, speaking to it because we don't only have 30 minutes, but there's a whole larger, there's like a 300-page World Bible, which was also a mind-blower for me, with governments and um, all the East Coast, which, you know, is, I guess, you know, Expansion Pack 7 or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, and out of this world comes this virus, and at the end of an episode, someone, we see someone die from it, and then that's the end of that episode. And then you go to, into the game world. Sure. And so what, one of the characters in the show is uh, Doc Ewell. And she calls uh, her counterpart in San Francisco, so uh, also an indigene. Um, and so now the players are doing a series of missions for the doctor in San Francisco where they have to collect reagents for the, for the cure for this nanite plague. And I think the real kicker is they have to do it before next week's episode or bad things are really, really gonna happen. And so I think that that back and forth, you know, particularly for the game player, where they get to go and do this, this thing and, and create a cure and then see it on television. I, I mean, I, I, I think that's awesome. And, and then in that next week's episode, as, as Nick said, um, she sends for the, for the uh, cure and she gets it and uh, all is well. Um, but I think what's really significant about as well, and uh, it's also true of uh, this crossover that we're going to show you actually, is you don't need to know anything about that. If you're a viewer of the TV series, you don't need to know what happened, where the cure came from. You're told it came from San Francisco, and that's fine. And as a gamer, uh, you go on this mission, whether you know about the TV series or not, you're going to have an, a great experience regardless. And I think that's really key is that you don't need to, you don't have, you should not feel like you need to know something else that I'm missing out. If I don't play the game, how am I going to enjoy the TV series? That's been a really principle that I think we've, I think we've done a pretty good job of keeping. Yeah. And, and, and I think for us, I mean, and I think it's a great point, maybe one we didn't touch at the beginning, is we really do want the products to be additive to one another, but they're standalone, right? right? And, and that was the key, right? We didn't, we, we didn't want players to replay an episode in, in the game, and, and you know, they, they didn't want players to replay a level in the game and the show and stuff. So if, if you're a gamer and you don't want to watch TV, you don't need to, you're going to have a great game playing Defiance. Same thing with the show, but if you have them together, you have this additive experience that gives you a deeper, broader um, insight into the Defiance universe. And, and, and I really like sort of the, the platform shift. You're going to talk about platform and, you know, it's an Xbox or PlayStation or PC. Well, really, at this point, it's the living room because you're sitting down and you're, you know, with your friends or your family and you're watching an episode of Defiance and maybe it's the one with, with the, the Nanite Contagion. You're like, oh, man, I'm going to, you know, I, I want to help find that cure and i got to get cracking because I t this and it's on in like two days. Um, and just without getting off your butt, you know, do the clicker, change the input, pick up your controller, and go. And I, and I just think that that's one of the things that, that's so great about this is it's, it's really just, you know, home entertainment at its best. I do think, though, it requires commitment at every level, at the corporate level. Uh, we're releasing the TV series worldwide uh, at the same time as the game is releasing worldwide, and that required discipline with a whole other partner of the studio and the international distribution folks and talking to those various markets, and so you really need a, a deep commitment across the board to really make that work because it's just not something you're doing casually or yeah. as a piece of commerce. There's a lot of force of will to keep this together. Indeed. Um, so I, I think the thing we'd like to set up and, and leave you with is, is this crossover that, that we're going to show with, uh, with Nolan and Orissa. Yeah, so, so um, this is actually the, you'll see the first scene of the pilot, um, and uh, it starts with a, a, a scene um, from the, with the avatars in the game, uh, in which they, it speaks for itself, but you'll, it gives you a really good example right off the bat of, of what we've yeah. been able to accomplish. Yeah, so you'll see, uh, so, so the game comes out April 2nd, the players do a series of missions with Nolan and Arisa who are introduced in the game before they're introduced in the show on April 15th. Um, the last thing the player will see after doing the series of missions is Nolan and Arisa driving towards St. Louis, and so what you're gonna see is 
the tail end of the game and it just transitioning into the show. Right. Would you guys roll tape, please? Arissa and me gotta get out of here while we still can. The gem's yours. It's worth a lot of script, but it's not worth dying over. Bring that shooter over. I want you to have that. Saved my life a couple of times, and so have you. Seems like a good fit. We need to leave. Now. Thank you. Careful with that gem, kid. People will do anything to get their hands on it. And I mean anything. Projected impact of 20 clicks.